So we begin with a virus, a story of a virus that hit planet Earth. And when this virus hit, it affected everyone. It was a virus called sin, a virus called death, death as a result of sin. And so when we see the effects of this virus, we begin to understand that it killed all of us. And the solution is not some sort of behavior management, but instead we needed resurrection. Uh, we needed resurrection because the problem is not what we're doing. The problem was this virus that hit us and killed us. And so in Romans 5, that's the story of what's happening. In Romans 5, as the chapter ends, we find that we have concluded that humanity is suffering from a pretty severe case of this sin virus. And it's spread to everyone. And then there's this competition to solve it. There's the one man who caused it, and then there's the one man who agrees to solve it. And so we see the, the clash of these two, the cause and the solution. And the cause is Adam, and the solution is Jesus Christ. Here we are in verse 17. If by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. So you see that the transgression of the one, the sin of the one, the apple in the garden with Adam and Eve, that sin, it wasn't about an apple. It was about rebellion. It was about drawing a line around ourselves, the human race, and saying, we are Lord of this ring. We don't need you. We can be like God without you. We can be like you instead of drawing upon life from you. We can imitate you instead of depending on you. That was the decision that was made. And with that, this virus killed every single one of us. And you know what happened. Did they have kids before or after this virus struck? Well, they had kids after this virus struck, right? And so then this virus was passed down in the DNA. It wasn't passed down in physical DNA, but spiritual DNA is just as real as physical DNA. And so it says, by the sin of the one, death reigned through this spiritual DNA. So you could be born into this life and you could be nice and you could be frugal and you could be giving and you could be loving, but you're still dead. You're still spiritually dead at the core. And in a sense, it's not your fault you were born that way. But in a sense, it's also our fault because humanity did it to themselves. So do you see, you don't become a sinner by what you do. You don't become a sinner by what you do. You are a sinner by what Adam did. And so it's the sin of another that caused this virus to pass down. And when we understand that, then we can see why we have to be made right by another. We became sinners by another. We're made righteous by another. It's not about us and what we're doing. It's about someone else and what he did. That's true both times. It's not about us and what we're doing. It's about Adam and what he did. Now, in Christ, it's not about us and what we're doing. It's about Jesus and what he did. Do you see that your rightness comes from another place? Your rightness comes from another person. Religion would say it's about you and it's progressive and you need to work on it and you are progressively becoming righteous. Well, did you progressively become a sinner? No. You didn't progressively become a sinner, did you? You were born that way. Did you progressively get more dead? No, you were born that way. In the same way, we are reborn in Jesus Christ and our righteousness is not progressive and our new life in Him is not progressive. You are not progressively becoming alive to Christ. We say things like, God, make me close, make me near. I want to be close. But you're either close or unclose. You're either close or far away. You're either alive or dead. You're either united with Christ or still in Adam. There is no middle ground. And that's why we have so much to celebrate. That's why this means so much. Because when it dawns on us, we become adamant about it. When it dawns on us, we see how powerful the gospel is. Why these guys 2,000 years ago would be willing to be taken from their families, crucified upside down, dragged away from their loved ones, stoned, killed, humiliated, mocked, 
What was it that made them so crazy over this Jesus? Was it that they were progressively becoming better people? No, it was more radical than that. Was it that they were progressively inching toward their God and slowly achieving closeness? No, they would have told you that they literally underwent a spiritual death. They died, their life ceased to exist, and then they woke up a brand new spiritual person, perfectly united with Christ. And that is indeed what has happened to you as well. And I want you to notice two things here. I want you to notice the word receive. I've underlined it here. There are those teaching today that, you know, even from Romans 5, this is their landmark passage. They say, we're all, we're all saved. We're all alive. The whole world is righteous. The whole world is alive in Christ. No decision is needed. Just like Adam ruined it for everybody, Christ fixed it for everybody, whether you like it or not. And their logic goes kind of like this. If Adam ruined it for everybody, how in the world could Christ not fix it for everybody? And that sounds like some really good human logic, but you could just flip it on them in a second and say, well, wait a minute, didn't Adam and Eve choose in the garden? And don't we also likewise get to choose life or reject Jesus today? They got to choose death or reject death. We get to choose life or reject life. And so the argument falls apart as we grasp at one word or another word when the whole of Scripture is staring us in the face. Today, if you hear His voice, don't harden your heart. Why would that warning be there? Because it's possible to harden your heart against the gospel. It is possible to reject it, to say no thank you, because a decision is in order when it comes to Jesus knocking on that door. The word receive is here for a reason. Not all of us on the planet have received the abundance of grace, but if you have Jesus Christ living in you today, I want you to notice what you have received. You have received two very large gifts. Number one, the abundance of grace. That is a ton of grace. In another place, it's called grace upon grace upon grace. There are people trying to tone down grace, get rid of grace, balance grace, water down grace. They're scared of grace. What we're going to find today is that grace is the only thing that stops sin. So if you want to tone down your grace, then you're going to tone down the stoppage of sin. If you want to try to tone down God's grace in your life and balance it with something else, then you are going to balance away your victory over sin. You'll see it. It'll be here today in this passage, and it's incredible. It's counterintuitive. We would think the law of God stops sin. We would think the strictness of God stops sin. We would think the fear of God, being scared of Him, would stop sin. None of that works. Have you not seen that in the most legalistic places in the world, what happens is they end up with the most heinous sins imaginable? And you say, where did that come from? My wife lived in Colombia for a number of years. She was in one of the most legalistic atmospheres you could imagine in, in South America. And lo and behold, the, one of the elders passed away and they had a funeral and there was tears and mourning everywhere. And then six months later, they found out he had changed his identity, moved to the town over and had a totally different family. <laughs> he was so whitewashed. He was so pure. He was so holy. He was so right. And everybody was intimidated by his holiness. And then the next thing you know, bam, something completely unexpected. What I'm saying is being scared of God, the legalistic way, full of rules, there is no freedom from sin in that. It will show its face. There is no freedom in that. We are going to see the way to freedom over sin today. And it's going to surprise some of us because it involves 100% grace and it involves a death, which we will look into together today. But I want you to notice this word receive. It is necessary to receive. And then secondly, what we have received. Number one, the abundance of grace, that is grace everywhere. Too much grace, so much grace you won't know what to do with it. And then number two, the gift of rightness. You are completely right with God, 100% off the charts righteous, off the charts right with Him as a free gift. We say it all the time, by grace you are saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And somehow then we say, but you got to get right with God. 
Now, wait a minute. I thought you just say, said, by grace, I've been saved. Oh, I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about rightness. So can you be saved without rightness? Can you be saved without being made justified? Can you be saved without being made righteous? It's impossible. God is perfect. And unless you have been made perfectly righteous, you're not saved. Being saved is being made perfectly righteous. That's why God had to do it. And it's not progressive. And you've got it. So if you've received the gift, open the box, look inside, and say, wow, with God. That's the rest of your Christian life. Open the box, look inside, and say, wow, with God. Amen? Amen. So then through one sin, one transgression, there resulted condemnation to all men. Even so, through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. This is called Greek parallelism. You'll notice the word all. This is where the guys come in, they ignore the whole of Scripture, they ignore every verse about decision, they ignore Scriptures about calling upon the name of the Lord, they ignore Scriptures about hardening your heart, they ignore Scriptures about opening the door, they ignore, ignore Scriptures about any decision, and they say, see, there's the word all, and so we'll build an entire doctrine on the word all. Here's the problem with that, the very next verse says many. So is it all or is it many, Paul? Which is it? Well, in this Greek parallelism, Paul is using language that is parallel. Watch this. Through the one sin, condemnation to all men. Through the one act of righteousness, justification of life to all men. What does that mean? Well, when you put all Scripture together, clearly, who is life offered to? All men. Who is it offered to? All men. But can some say no to it? Absolutely, and they do. And so you see in verse 19, through one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. Paul, why didn't you say all? Well, look what he says next. Even so, through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. Now that's interesting. There's two things of interest here. Number one, he says many, not all. Number two, he says will be made righteous. But see, if God has already just pushed his righteousness on everyone apart from a decision, why would this say will be? Why would this be future tense? Why would this be an ongoing effort on the part of God to make people righteous as he appeals to them through Jesus Christ? I'm not saying your righteousness is progressive. You're either in or you're out. But what I'm saying is God has put the offer on the table, hasn't he? He has invited all men to the table. All of humanity is invited. And yet some people will say, no, thank you. And so this is why the many will be made righteous. And it's going on throughout history, isn't it? As people hear and believe the gospel message. So what have we seen so far? I guess we've seen that a virus has hit and yet grace wins. A virus has hit planet earth. And yet when there's a competition between Adam and Jesus, grace wins every single time. Verse 20, the law came in so that the transgression would increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Those out there who want to push law on people, maybe not all of the law, but a pinch of law. You give me a pinch of law, you're inviting me to a pinch of sin. You give me a heavy dose of law, you're inviting me to a heavy dose of sin. Maybe even it's worse than that. A little leaven leavens the whole lump, the Bible says. So a pinch of law might just ruin everything. Do you see what this verse is saying? It is saying that the law came in so that sin would do what? What does sin do when the law comes in? Does it shriek and run over to the corner and whimper? No, the law comes in and the sin, sin says, I've got an opportunity to operate. The law comes into the room and sin gets excited Romans 7 says this. It says that the commandment affords sin an opportunity. You tell somebody, don't do something, don't do something, don't do something. Guess what? They're going to do it. They didn't even think of it till you told them not to do it. <laughs> Be careful what you tell your kids not to do if they haven't thought it up first. If you come to your kids with a long list of what they shouldn't do, give it 20 minutes and guess what? They're going to do something on that list. They hadn't even thought of it, but when the commandment came, sin becomes alive. Doesn't it? 
Was it not too long ago, a couple weeks back, I showed you that sign, that road sign that said no shooting and it had bullet holes all through it? <laughs> when the law comes in, sin increases. Where sin increased, what happens with grace? Oh, does grace not know what to do? Does grace go, oh, well, you, you used it up. Does grace say, oh, it's not enough here. Does grace say, well, the blood of Jesus ran out. No, grace abounds all the more. Those who are trying to say too much grace is not right, that we need to temper the grace, water down the grace, get rid of the grace, they're missing it. They are missing it. Grace is the doorway to victory. Grace is the doorway to victory over sin because when you experience grace upon grace upon grace, something happens to your heart. Your heart is softened and you recognize if this God has done this for me, if he has treated me this way no matter what, wow, then I am interested in what he has to say about everything. Verse 21, he says, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You'll notice that he's comparing the two. I mean, would you say that sin reigned in this world? That sin reigns in death? As you look over at the Middle East, as you look at the conflicts in Europe, as you look at our own nation, as you look at the war and the hate and the conflict and the infighting, and all of the heinous-looking symptoms of death, would you not say that sin reigns in this world? He is drawing a parallel between that and how much more grace reigns. So if we are ready in a heartbeat to look around the world and say, dead, 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 the sin result, the sin virus, the sin is the cause of all of this. Look at the power of this sin. Look what it's done. What Paul is saying is how much more should we look within us then and say, wow, the grace of God, the power of his grace, how much more has he rescued me? So we recognize death. He's asking us to recognize life. We recognize sin. He's asking us to recognize righteousness. You are quick to say the whole world is born sinners. Are you quick to say that you've been reborn righteous? You are quick to say that the whole world is, you know, that's dirty and wicked and rotten and sinful. Are you just as quick to say that you, by this radical new birth and by the obedience of somebody else, that you are holy and blameless and righteous? Because their death has nothing to do with their actions. And your holiness has nothing to do with your actions. Their death has nothing to do with their actions, and your righteousness has nothing to do with your actions. It is called faith righteousness, isn't it? For a reason. And we say, oh, yeah, 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 that's how I got saved. See, then you're going to take that faith righteousness, and you're going to push it to one day in your life. And what I'm saying is you take that faith righteousness concept, that righteousness by faith, and you stretch it out over a lifetime, and into eternity, and you say, I will always be as righteous as Jesus because of my faith in him. I will always be as righteous as Jesus. You didn't mishear me. There are not two flavors of righteousness, Jesus level and other. There are not two kinds of righteousness, God level and then you. The Bible says you have become the righteousness of God. Now that's a dare. That is a dare. God is daring you to believe that you are as righteous as Jesus Christ. What will you do with that? If he calls you the righteousness of God, are you going to accept some sort of imaginary form of righteousness that you've cooked up in your mind? Living in the Bible Belt, we cook up all kinds of righteousness. Yeah, that's positional. That sounds cool. Not in the Bible. Sounds really smart, though. Positional righteousness. Is Jesus positionally righteous? No, Jesus is just righteous. Well, then what do you call it when he makes you born again, born of the Spirit with a new nature, a new heart? You're righteous, not positionally, just actually, like real, like it's, it's authentic. It's right now. So as sin reigned, grace would also reign through righteousness and eternal life, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
man, this sounds awesome. So much grace. I mean, the way he talks about it, it sounds like there's no limit, right? I mean, grace upon grace upon grace, grace increases, grace abounds. So you can see the question on their lips. But, 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 but what about behavior? So, 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 so can we just do whatever we want? Do you see it? And if you don't ask that, then you haven't understood chapter 5. Chapter 5 forces you to ask this question. If you understand chapter 5 of Romans, then you have to ask this question because grace is gigantic. You will never out God's grace. So then why not just go out and sin? Set world records for sin. Why not? Be the, the biggest, most visible, most obvious sinner in Lubbock. Wouldn't that be cool? Like a little medal you got for that? So you see the logic behind this then. If grace is so enormous, then why not just abuse it every day? It ain't going nowhere. It's not running out. Now notice Paul's answer. Paul does not say, uh, I, I forgot to tell you, yeah, it will run out. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, oh, oh I forgot to tell you, yeah, God will be totally ticked off at you. He doesn't say, oh, I forgot to tell you there's 17 levels to heaven. You'll make it in, but you'll be in a little apartment. (laughs) He doesn't say, oh, I I, I forgot to tell you everybody else is going to be loaded down with the Mr. T jewels and you are going to be stuck with one little silver chain. It's going to be embarrassing, but you'll be in. This is not Paul's logic. This is not what he gives us to go on. What he gives us is this. Oh yeah, grace will increase. Oh yeah, grace will abound. Oh, you're right about the grace thing. It ain't going nowhere. The blood of Jesus will not run out. But have you considered uh, this other part of the gospel that maybe you don't really understand yet? And here it is. It's a bit of a secret. It's now revealed. It's going to be all over my letters, but here it is. You don't really want to sin. You think you want to sin. The enemy tricks you into thinking you want to sin. And then you're on the other side of every single time you choose it. And then what? Look at you. Pathetic. Miserable. Confused. You don't really want to sin. God would say, do you think I'm stupid? Do you think I'm stupid? I would just give you grace upon grace upon grace, a license to sin, total forgiveness. I would just let you off the hook for everything and then not go in here and change what you want. Do you think I'm naive? Do you think I'm I'm reckless? No, there is an order to this. And the order to this is I forgive everything out here, but then I come in here and I put my spirit within you and I cause you to walk in my ways. You used to be a slave of sin, but I came in here and I made you obedient from the heart. That's heartfelt. That's real. That's genuine. You can't get away from obedience. Do you know that, Christian? There are legalists out there talking about, well, they don't stress obedience. Well, they don't talk about obedience. Look, the Bible says you can't help it. Your nature, you are a slave of obedience now. That means you're connected to obedience. When we teach identity, we are teaching freedom from sin. Because we are saying that your new heart doesn't want it. And when you discover that and live by the heart, you won't be choosing sin. Do you see it? You are a slave of obedience. That doesn't mean you're a slave like a Civil War slave. People get upset at that. No, that's not what God is saying. He's saying you are harnessed to obedience just as you were harnessed And controlled by sin, you are now harnessed and controlled by obedience and righteousness. You can't help it. You can't get away from it. If you go, you want a surefire way to be miserable, go out and sin. If you're a child of God, I promise you, you will be miserable sinning. And if you can go out and love sin and just love it and love it and love it for 10 years straight and have no conflict inside, you're not born again. I said, if there's no conflict inside, you're not born again because Christ doesn't live in there. I'm not saying you couldn't deny the conflict. There are people that live in denial. There are people that live acting like, oh, yeah, I'm cool with this. This is no big deal. I can do this. This is going to turn out right in the end. This is going to make me. We can live in denial. We can come up here and live in denial about this place. But if you're born again, this place is born again. 
If you're born again, this place is born of God's Spirit, and you cannot get away from your heart. That's why in the next verse, he's going to say, how can we? That's his verbiage. Are you kidding me? How can we continue to live in sin? Have you not seen your heart? Have you not seen your nature? Do you not realize what's happened to you? How can we? We can't get away from this righteousness. You can't run and run and run and run and get away from God and get away from this righteousness because it's in you and he's in you forever. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? What would happen if we continued in sin? What would happen to grace? It would abound. It would increase. Correct? I mean, that's the logic of this verse. Should you abuse grace because you know it's going to increase? May it never be, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? This is his answer. He doesn't say God's going to be ticked off. He doesn't say you're going to be in a lesser heaven. He doesn't say the blood of Jesus is going to run out. He says, here's your reasoning. Here's your answer. You've died to sin. How in the world do you think that you can keep on living in it with this new heart? Do you see it? It's nature-based. Not nurture. Nurture says, oh, we need to cultivate you and we need to shape you and mold you and invest in you and eventually you'll be dead to sin. We need to educate you and you need to memorize every verse in the Bible and you need to be in church every time the doors are open and you need to be in Bible study five nights a week and then we will nurture you and mold you and shape you and eventually you'll be dead to sin. Well, after 27 years of that, you might be a fraction dead to sin in that logic. That's not the gospel. The gospel is day one, moment one, that you are taken out of Adam and put in Christ. It's not about nurture. It's about nature. And your heart is dead to sin, period. Your heart is dead to sin and alive to God. There's more to it, not just dead to sin. Did you hear the alive to God part? It's coming. Or do you not know? Tons of Christians, crosses hanging around our necks. We know about forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness. What's Christianity about? Jesus died on the cross. What's, forget, what's, what's Christianity about? It's about forgiveness. Jesus died on the cross. What's Christianity about? It's about forgiveness in heaven. Well, this is neither. He's not talking about either. It's not about forgiveness. It's not about heaven. It's about do you know that all of us in this room, all of us watching this, all of us listening, all of us who are in Christ... All of us have been put into Christ's death. It says we've been baptized into Christ Jesus. We've been baptized into his death. You might think he's talking about this tub of water over here. There's no mention of water in six chapters of Romans. This has nothing to do with water. This is about being immersed in Jesus and getting immersed in his death. And then it's going to say getting immersed in his resurrection. And this is the only way. The only way to understand how you're going to stop lusting. The only way to understand how you're going to stop being critical about people and, and be quiet when it's time to be quiet and not, not backstab people. The only way that you're going to understand how to move forward with your sin issue is when you understand that victory over sin comes through death. That's it. And that when that thought comes... You can count yourself dead because you died to it. It's death talk that works. It is the only thing that works. You can say, I'm going to work on that. I'm going to do 10 steps. I'm going to breathe before I speak. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to. And it's not self-help. It's death. You can't help yourself. Your old self died. That's the answer. Therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism into death. So that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. He didn't leave you in the tomb. He raised you up to walk in newness of life. Being immersed in Jesus means you went to Calvary. You went into the tomb. You went into resurrection. In fact, Ephesians 2 says you went into ascension with him and you were seated with him in heavenly places. So you got carried through the whole Jesus process and now you're sitting here today in this building, but you're also sitting in Jesus. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Again, this is that sort of Greek logic. It's that parallelism, if you will, likeness, likeness. 
And then you say, did he leave me in the tomb? And the answer is no, he didn't leave you in the tomb. You're also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. You'll notice there's several words here that are important. Old self, what happened to it? Was crucified. What tense is that verb? Ever since you were in fourth grade, probably, you knew some of your verb tenses, right? This is past. It is a past tense verb form. And that's why it's so important to grasp that because there are people saying you need to die to self. So if you need to die to self, then you're not dead yet. See, then you've got your Monty Python theology. I'm only mostly dead, right? (laughs) No, this is dead, dead. This is mafia dead. This is you're dead to me, dead. Okay, this is Godfather dead. All right? This is when the horse head is in the bed. The horse is dead. (laughs) This is dead, dead. So you don't need to die if you've died. So I guess the question walking out of here today is you're going to have to ask yourself, do I need to die or have I died? If you're saved, if you've got Christ living in you, you don't need to die, you've died. Notice also it says, why did God do this? So that we would no longer be slaves of sin. You know what Romans 7 says? Miserable man that I am. It's coming up soon, Romans 7. Miserable man that I am. I'm sold in bondage to sin. People try to say that's, that's Paul after he's a Christian. I think we're going to discover it's not. It's Paul telling his story about how he fought the law and the law won. You know the song? I'm not going to make you sing it. But Paul fought the law and the law won. Miserable man that I am, who will rescue me? I need salvation. Who will rescue me? Thanks be to God. Jesus Christ came into the picture. He's telling the story just like, hey, a guy walks into a bar He's telling the story, hey, I walked right into the law experience and it killed me. And miserable I was, and who will set me free? And I was, past tense, sold in bondage to sin. And he says, what's the only way through? Well, I gave it to you a chapter ago. It's called dying with Jesus. And if you die with Jesus, you're no longer a slave to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. For he who does a thousand quiet times is freed from sin. For he who goes to church 578 times, finally you get dead to sin. For he who, for he who, what? What is the answer to getting free from sin? You need to see it. It sounds morbid at first. We don't understand it at first. But this is the way. This is the gate. This is the door. It is understanding your death. Consider yourself dead to that thought. And consider yourself alive to this thought. Why? Because it's brain games? No, because it's real. It's a heartfelt experience that your heart will confirm. You may not know what to feel for the 17 seconds that you have to choose. But during those 17 seconds, I promise you that if you will count yourself dead to that thought and count yourself alive to that thought, 17 seconds later, Maybe 17 minutes later, maybe 17 hours later. I don't know when your feelings are going to catch up, but you on a heart level will know uh, my heart confirms. I am dead to that, and I'm so glad I didn't do it. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, meaning he didn't leave us in the tomb. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, I hope you'll see this. This is a big deal. Christ is never to die again, okay? Now, now, why is that important? We know that. He's never going to die again. But in a minute, Paul is going to tell you, you will never die again. You don't need to die to sin more. You don't need to die progressively. Jesus died once to sin. You died once to sin. Watch this. Never to die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin how many times? once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. Did Jesus need to die to sin? Jesus never committed a single sin in his life, right? Why would Jesus need to die to sin? I know he died for sins. That's different. 
Have you understood the difference? We're not talking about Jesus dying for sins. This is not Jesus dying for the penalty of your sins. This is Jesus dying to the power of sin. Saying, sin, I am dead to you. Okay, you see the difference? Dying for your sins with an S on the end is different than dying to sin as a power. One is for the penalty of your sins. The other is because of the power of sin over us. So why did Jesus need to die to sin? Here it is. Even so, in the same way, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Put these two verses together. How many times did Jesus die? Once. Even so, in the same way, consider yourselves to be dead to sin. How many times did you die to sin? Once. Are you dying to sin? No, it is not progressive or ongoing. It is finished. Sound familiar? It is finished. Your death to sin is finished. Notice also the other good news is not just death, it's life. You're alive to God. He likes you. You're connected. You're one in Christ. You're united with Him. All right, well, we'll finish with this. Because of that then, man, this sounds real good, but where does the sin come from? I mean, duh, that's a good question to ask, right? Where does the sin come from? If I'm new, if I'm crucified, buried, raised, where does the sin come from? Look at this. Don't let sin reign in your body so that you obey what? It's lusts. Where do the lusts come from? Are you dirty? Are you lustful, Christian? Are you born of the Spirit as a lustful person? Are you born of God as a lustful person? No, look what it says. It's lusts. The lusts come from where? The lusts come from it, and it refers to a power called sin. It's a foreign agent. It's a parasite. It's in you, but it's not you. Do not go on presenting the members of your body to this agent, to this parasite, as instruments of unrighteousness, but instead do the logical thing, guys. Present ourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Last verse, sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Oh, watch out for that grace. Look at what this verse says. If you're going to watch out for that grace and get rid of that grace and push down that grace and balance that grace and water down that grace, then you are going to let sin master you. Because by grace, God has shown you the door By grace, God has shown you the gate. And here it is. I'm dead to that thought and I'm alive to you, God. I am dead to that sin and I'm alive to my Jesus. That is the way forward. By grace. Conclusion, what did we see today? We received an abundance of grace. Grace everywhere. Grace upon grace. We received the gift of righteousness. God's not naive. He said grace out here, righteousness in here. The world was made sinners through one sin. We have been made righteous through one act of obedience. That's Jesus on the cross and through the resurrection. You're righteous because of somebody else. If we continue in sin, grace will increase. Did you hear that? If we continue in sin, grace will increase. But we died to sin, so how can we? We died and were raised with Jesus... Death is the only way to get free from sin. Jesus died to sin once, not over and over. In Him, we died to sin once too. Consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God. Sin is a force that is working in you, but it's not you. Sin will not master us because we are under God's grace. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for these simple truths. They are simple. They involve death and life and things we understand on a physical level. We understand what death is. Death is life no more. Death is just death. It is so clear. It's black and white. Father, I pray that by your spirit that you would make it black and white for us. That we would see that we've either died to sin or we haven't. That we're either alive to you or we aren't. That we are either 100% righteous like Jesus or we are not. And that there is no middle ground. Father, we thank you. There is no partial death. There is no progressive death. There is no partial life. There is no progressive life. 
Father, we thank you that we can call ourselves, that we can consider ourselves and count ourselves dead to sin in every moment and alive to you in every single moment. Father, remind us of these truths as we need it, and we need it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.